Joshua chapter 6. Um, just before Christmas, Bethany took us um, through chapter 5. Um, I would encourage you, if you've not listened to that or you weren't here, I would go on YouTube and have a listen. It, it's brilliant. Um, when Bethany sent out the list of teachings to look at, I must admit, I did look at that one and go, mm, no, I don't, want, I don't want to teach that. It actually ha it turned out to be my favorite one. Um, so yeah, uh, the Israelites came through the Jordan, um, came, settled in Gilgal, where the Lord um, has been bringing them through this preparation time. And finally in Gilgal, um, he dealt there with um, still some, you know, some of the hearts weren't quite right. And he needed to prepare them um, to have a clean heart and to get um, into the promised land, you know, clean slate. He needed them to be right with him. So uh, as, as Bethany spoke about, while they're in Gilgal, they were under that refining knife, um, which I think we often find ourselves there. And if you read all the way back to Deuteronomy, um, you'll see in there, the Lord was preparing the hearts even then for this time. And now they're ready to conquer. I think it's really good that we start a new year off in this chapter. It's almost like, say, a clean slate. They're right with the Lord and they are prepared, ready for victory. So I'm not going to read the whole of chapter 6 straight through because I've just got over a really bad um, throat and, and, and Ill, illness. So I'm going to read through just verse 1 through to chapter 10 and then I'll pick things out um, after that just because I don't want my voice to give up. Um, so chapter 6 verse 1. And it says, Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days, and seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. And Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city and let him who is armed advance before the Ark of the Lord. So it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the ark, while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. Now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, Shout, and then you shall shout. So they've reached the promised land. Um, the Lord has prepared them for the destruction of Jericho. And it says in verse 1 that now Jericho was securely shut up because, the children of it, because of the children of Israel. So they knew that the children of Israel were on the way. And uh, let's just get a quick look at who the people of Jericho were. These were the Canaanites. Um, this was the first section of land that they were going to conquer. And obviously it was the hardest part in Romans chapter 1, it just gives us a quick description of just who we're dealing with here and why the Lord wanted these completely wiped out. And it says in verse 21, Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools." And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. 
Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. So these were a people um, who were really, really corrupt. They, they knew, they knew, they had a, a knowledge of God. They knew the Israelites were on the way, but they had they, there was no way that they were bowing their knee, that they were repent, repentant. There, they were no, there was no sign of of any surrender whatsoever. Um, and yeah, you can just see that it says here, you know, that they. They were professing to be wise, but they were fools. They were, they were worshipping idols and, and getting up to all sorts, all kinds of evil practices. Uh, Jericho was a fortified city, which means it was a city of strong defences. And I don't know if you've ever seen a picture. I've, I've not got one to show you this evening, but it literally was a walled city. But it was a wall and then another wall within the wall. And then you've got the armed defences around the wall. So seemed p- pretty impenetrable. They were, you know, anyone would think there's no way we're getting in there. Um, but Jericho in our day, I feel it is a picture of, um, for us, is a world mm. ripe for judgment. So this is the picture that we get now, the world that we live in, and why the Lord is going to come back and judge so, yeah, they knew the Israelites were coming. They refused to repent. Um, they thought the walls would save them. Um, like many people, they trust, don't they, in their idols and their wicked practices um, more than the one true living God. Um, you know, and even though they were terrified, they just, they just still carried on in the ways. Um, that Their idols had more of a pull on them than, than the fear of the Lord. Um, so, yeah, having a knowledge of God, but ignoring it. And, you know, that's the world that we live in today, isn't it? Um, people do trust in, you know, things rather than the Lord. I know quite quite a few people that I know, you know, they put their security in houses and, and wealth and cars and popularity, likability, you know, what social media is like. You know, we're all... You know, we want the most likes, don't we? And, um, and that's their kind of security. That's what they base their whole life upon. And also, just the fact that people say, but I'm a good person, it, it almost gives them that feeling of, but I'm all right, I'm a good person. But unless you know the Lord, then, you know, we're not safe. Um, and these things that, that, as Christians, you know, we're, we're guilty of doing this as well. We can put things that, come between us and the Lord and you know we build those walls up around us and uh, just like the world you know sometimes we we want something tangible don't we that we feel that you know we we can feel and see Um, but the Lord you know in his word he reassures us that you know those that walk with him they they were with him they saw him and yet they still didn't believe you know they still you know when he did all these miracles, you know, that it, it wasn't enough for them. And um, in John chapter 20, verse 29, Jesus said to Thomas, you know, because you have seen me and you have believed, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. So, you know, we, that's faith, isn't it? That's having faith to know that what we can't see is, is real and that he's going to work in our lives. So, um, Ask you, you know, you need to ask yourself, I suppose, you know, do we need to go back into Gilgal? Do we need to be under that knife of refinement? You know, is there still some, re- some sort of rebellion in our hearts? Are we still hanging on to things that are no good for us? Chuck Smith said in one of his commentaries that I read, um, he did a, quite a few of these. I only wrote a couple down, uh, just it's more so for chapter five and six. And he said, their passing over the Jordan River is a type of our finally reckoning our own man to be dead, that we should no longer live after the flesh, but finally live after the spirit. And they're conquering the land, a type of finally conquering those strongholds of our flesh. But don't be confused um, here. Um, 
between people like the Canaanites and people that don't know the Lord. I don't want you to think just because someone doesn't know the Lord and, you know, they're living, you know, just however they want to. It doesn't mean to say that, that they won't know the Lord. You know, keep praying for these people. God knows the hearts of people, and he knew the hearts of the Canaanites. And this is why, you know, like I say, he wanted them, you know, wiped out. So we see in verse 2... Um, God assures Joshua, um, he says, and the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hand. Um, so God assures Joshua that he's already given the, the land into their hands. Um, and this is past tense, so which obviously means it's already done. And, and there's that reassurance um, that he gives them again. You know, they've come through that whole time of preparation and now at this point, he's giving Joshua the instruction here to then give the instructions to the priests and to the rest of the people in the army. Um, when God gives us a promise, you know, do we walk out in faith in that promise? Do we make that first step forward? Um, Joshua telling the priests, you know, both Joshua and, you know, they, they would have all had to have had great faith um, because A, the priests, you know, being told they've got to go out into battle with the ark, they wouldn't normally have gone out into battle. So for them, it was something completely different. And this was the first part of conquering the land and the hardest part, like I say, because the walls, everything, it just seemed impossible. Um, but Joshua gave that command to proceed and that's the thing, um, as hard as the battle may look, as hard as any situation that we may be in or confronted with, unless we step out in faith, then, you know, the Lord, he will be with us, that's his promise, but we have to do our bit as well. And he could have just knocked the walls down, he could have just wiped the city out, but he wanted the, the Israelites to, to trust him and to walk out in that. So the first part of conquering the land uh, obviously must have seemed impossible. Um, everything that God commanded in here, though, is, is for a reason. Um, we have to remember that. Um, you know, it shows their strength of faith and their courage. And, um, and of course, they would have been strengthened by Joshua's faith, faith as well. So... The orders that they give, the first order is obviously to march out. Um, they've, got, they've been told they've got to march around the walls. Um, one thing that struck me when I was reading this, and I'd never seen it before, was the fact that he orders the armed guards to go first, and then you have the Ark of the Covenant, and then you have the priests and the, the rear guard and the rest of the people following behind. What I noticed there was the fact that God was center of the whole thing. So, um, yeah, they were going out, they were making that first step, but they put God center. And I thought that was a really important point to make for us. When we're faced with something, always put Jesus center of every decision and everything that you do. Um, as well, when I was reading this, I thought about the Queen's funeral. I know you probably all watched that, but that was almost quite a similar thing with the procession. You got the, the they were marching in the front, you got the Queen on the, the gun carriage, and then you'd got, you know, the marching behind, and then the, the, obviously her family and everything behind. And the most poignant part of that whole thing, I felt, was in the beginning, it was the bagpipes, the drums, the trumpets, that music that was playing, and it was continuous. And you almost, it kind of gripped you, and you couldn't, you couldn't do anything but focus on the fact that, you know, the queen was no longer here, and, and it kind of brought about all these emotions. Um, and then we move on here, because the, God ordered that the priests, seven priests, blow seven trumpets, and again, there's a reason behind everything that, that God instructed here. So when we read in Numbers 10, verse 8 and 9, God had already com this was already a command that God had given that only the priest should, drip, should blow the trumpets, not just here, 
but on, you know, di for different occasions for when they're going out to war, for festivals, for all these things to make people alert. It says in verse 8, the sons of Aaron and the priests shall blow the trumpets and these shall be to you as an ordinance forever throughout your generations. When you go to war in your land against the enemy who oppress you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets and you will be remembered before the Lord your God and you will be saved from your enemies. So, yeah, God used this in this circumstance. The blowing of the trumpets, he said, it was a sign that they had got the victory so that every time they heard those trumpets blowing, they would remember that God has given us the victory. And it's that thing, isn't it? You're just focusing on that and you're just marching out and you're stepping forward and you're listening to his voice the whole time. It's just encouraging you to keep going. The priest's job normally were to intercede and to offer sacrifices um, for the people. And here you can see that, you know, even the priests are encouraging in, them in this. Um, and what I took from this was, you know, the priests needed encouragement too. And yes, we all get encouraged when we step out and we serve the Lord, you know, just spending time studying this. It's just, yeah, I've, I've learned so much through it and the Lord's really ministered to me. But it just brought to mind, you know, our, our pastor Bryce and, you know, and all our leaders, they need the encouragement too. And I think as a church, we need to remember that, that, you know, we, we take so much from them, but we, we really need to give back to them. So they're marching around the walls and you just think again, why march for seven days? I mean... <laughs> What is, the, what is the point in w walking? Well, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's that, that thing of walking out in faith. And it's even though they're waiting for those walls to come down, they know they're going to get the victory. And that's for us, you know, when we're waiting for things in our life to change or, you know, for a victory in, in an area, you know, we can't just sit waiting. We've got to be active in just continuing to live our lives for the Lord and, and just, um, yeah, just in that time of waiting, um, there's so, so many reasons why he orders us to do that and these. And Bethany titled this teaching, When Going Around in Circles Brings Victory. Well, you know, I always say, oh, I'm just going around in circles. I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. Well, I like that, what Bethany said, because that's the kind of attitude that we should have. You know, we should have this positive, you know, it's a glass half full, not half empty attitude. Um, and I'm, I love this whole, you know, the brain and how the brain works. And um, I don't know if you've heard about these neuro pathways. Our brains were made and created uh, to, to learn new things and we can develop new pathways in our brain. It's just the way God created us. Um, and, you know, something that I just saw, it's, it's easier to revive something that's already there. Sometimes I think we have giftings and or the Lord's told us to do something. And maybe we've just thought or given up on something or just thought, no, he, he can't mean me or, you know, I just don't feel good enough. I think it's always easier to revive so I, Revive something that's already there rather than to create a new pathway. Um, and when I was writing this down, I, I don't know, this could be for somebody in this room that I just felt that, is there something in your life that you felt the Lord's told you to do, but through lack of confidence or listening to other people, you've just neglected that gift? Um, well, I'm just saying today, the Lord's saying, you need to step out and do that. For me, you, you must not listen to the voices around you. So when we're walking out our faith, it shows great courage and trust in the Lord. Um, and again, while we're waiting, again, there's a reason in Isaiah 40, verse 31, it says, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And it is really hard to wait on the Lord. But you know, when we do, 
And sometimes there's, there's, I've got so many situations in my life, I'm still waiting. It just feels like these things are never going to come to pass. But while we're waiting, you know, we don't even realize how it strengthens our faith, how it it's shows our obedience to the Lord. It's given us that time to think. I know over the years I've been waiting on certain things that the Lord's actually shown me that it's me that needs to change. You know, you're praying for that other person, you know, make them change, Lord. But actually, the Lord shows you in that time, if you're going to hear him, if you're going to have that time with him and listen to him, there's things in your life he might want to change about you. You know, it's that refining process. And the end result, you know, when it comes to pass, ultimately it just increases your faith. And we all know the implications of not waiting. We all know the story of Sarah and Abraham, don't we, where God said, you know, that he would give them a child. And they grew impatient. And obviously, um, Sarah, you know, said to Hagar and Abraham, you know, you two get together and let's have a baby. And Ishmael came along. And we all know the problems that that created. And and that's the thing, when we step out of God's will, when we don't listen to what he's saying and we go off and we run off and do our own thing, it, it just never, ever goes well. So moving on to the command where um, Joshua said, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth. I thought, this is the worst one for me. <laughs> Someone tell, telling me not to talk, that's like, that's going to be a miracle. A couple of weeks ago, I got really sick, and I ended up with laryngitis. And let me tell you, that was difficult. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever had laryngitis, but you, every time you try to talk, not only is your voice disappearing, the pain is incredible. And the frustration that it is when you're trying to tell your husband not to do something, it's like, oh. Yeah, I just, for someone to tell me not to talk, I am, yeah, I need to learn to be a bit more quiet. Um, again, God knew, and he knows our frame, and he, he knew why he gave this command to them. Because imagine, they're all pacing around the walls. First, you know, I'm sure they set off, you know, with all the good intentions, remembering they've been prepared, and they've been encouraged, and they're trusting, you know, and, and yeah, that they would have probably set out on a really good foot, but I should imagine by about the third or fourth day, they'd have started to flag. Um, well, I know I would have done. Uh, maybe with them not talking, listening you know, to the sound of the trumpet, maybe that kept them going. But imagine if there wasn't a command not to talk. Um, what do we do when, when we're in a situation like that? We grumble and we complain. And then you discourage yourself, don't you, through grumbling and complaining. And you can talk yourself out of anything if you, when you get into that mindset. And I think the worst thing is we speculate, you know, oh, I wonder what's going to happen. Um, or do you think, oh, that might not happen. And then, you know, before you know it, you've discouraged everybody else as well. And uh, it's a massive distraction. Um, Mark on Sunday, he talked about distraction. And I did think to myself, you know, I am the easiest distract. I get e the easily is distract. I can't say that. I get distracted easily. Um, if somebody's talking <laughs> when I'm listening to something, when I was studying for this, I had to go out in the garden and sit in the summer house because Jonathan, I could just hear him, and it just put me off. Um, but yeah, it, I I get very easily distracted, um, and. Yeah, so again, God knew. He knew why he wanted them to just stay quiet. A few areas in Scripture where it talks about us being quiet. One in Exodus 14, verse 14, it said, The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to be silent. How many times do we get in a situation with somebody where, you know, not necessarily arguing, but you want to get your point across, you know, because they've wound you up and you think, well, I'm just going to tell them. Well, the Lord's saying, well, no, just leave it with me. And it, it's so hard to do. Another one, James 1.19, it says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And I, I, I used to be terrible, probably still am terrible at this, but 
Have you ever been in a group chatting and you're just butting in and getting your opinion over across all the time and you're not really listening to what the other person's saying because you want to get your point across? Yeah, and you can end up getting really frustrated. Um, Proverbs 17, 28, even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. So even the stupidest person, even when they stay quiet, you know, they look intelligent. So moving on, it says, and Joshua rose early in the morning. Now I might ruffle some feathers here. I know I've ruffled them in the past, but I keep banging on this drum. I've had years of practice at this. I've been bringing up children for 35 years. I've had every kind of stress you can ever imagine. Those of you that know me, I've disability, chronic illness, you name it. And I've had to learn and the, the hard way, but what I have learned is, and Bethany actually got me off on this a few years ago. I said to her, how do you have your quiet time? She said, if I don't pick my Bible up before I get out of bed, I won't have it. So I kind of stuck to that, and it works for me. And the fact is, what I found before is, rather than leaving it till the evening, when the day's gone by and all the troubles of the day have happened, you haven't spent that time with the Lord, and he's not prepared you. It makes such a difference how you react to something when you've spent time with the Lord. If you leave it till the end of the day, there's no guarantee that you will have dealt with that situation very well. And that goes for evening times as well. How we spend our evening will reflect on what we want to do first thing in the morning. And I have to admit, me and my husband have got into a really bad habit of watching reels. Does anybody watch reels? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Those things that you just keep flicking and you can spend the whole day looking and they are addictive, but they are really bad. And let me tell you, start filling your head full of junk like that the night before. The following morning, you will not want to have any kind of good food in your soul. You'll just crave that junk. I've said it before. You go and eat a big McDonald's when you're going home and you know you've got a healthy dinner prepared. You're not going to want that. You're just going to crave more junk food. So, yeah... Just be, just be aware of that. It's something that, again, the Lord pointed out to me in this. Um, so they've, they've reached day seven. It's the hardest day. They've got to go around the city seven times. And, and I, I, I would imagine, again, that they are really fired up for this by now. You know, they know the victory is near. They know they're going to get through those walls. They're going to conquer that city. But it's like anything, when you've been battling something for a long time, when you're coming towards the end of it, you get really weary and you feel like giving up. And, you know, I suppose the Lord as well knew that. And maybe that's why he, he, he stretched it out more on the last day, because those guards on that wall must have been looking at them going around like, what are they doing? By day seven... I'll bet you they were like, oh, just put your feet up, lads. Go and get a cup of tea, you know, not realizing what was to come. They let their guard down, and I think I'm wondering if the Lord knew that. And then they do that, and then Joshua gives the command to shout, and the walls came down. And you imagine not being able to talk for seven days, and then you, he says, shout, and you know you're doing this for the Lord. And you, the amount of people that would have been there and the, the noise of the walls coming down, I mean, that in itself would have been incredible. I remember back in the 70s being in bed at home. We had gale force winds and we had a big wall at the back and it blew it down. And I, I will never forget that noise. It was terrifying. So if you really think about the atmosphere and what happened in that moment, it would be absolutely mind-blowing. But you imagine how that would have increased their faith. And it would have spurred them on to, to get in there and, and do what God had commanded them to do. So now they're in. And we go down to verse 18. And it says, And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things. And make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble. 
I have to say, when I read that, I just like went, oh no. <laughs> because it's just that temptation, isn't it? Um, God knows our weakness. He would have known their weak frames as well. You know, plowing around all those days, they would have been tired. They might have just let the guard down a bit because they thought, well, we're in now, you know, we're going to gain victory. Um, and God knew he knows the hearts and he's like, don't go near those things. Do not touch those things. I have just took you through Gilgal. You, you have been, you know, stripped back of all those things. Do not enter back into that. You know, do not return to old sins. Um, and they, we do it, you know, when we're tired, you know, we've fought a battle. We've, we've gone through something really hard. We get the victory and then it's like, oh, yeah, just... You know, I do that, it won't hurt. Everybody else is doing it at church. It doesn't matter, but it does matter. And, you know, again, God doesn't want that for us. So God also said here that they would not profit from the land. And the picture we get here is, this is the first bit of land that they're going to conquer of the promised land. And this is a picture of the first fruits. And the reason why God's saying, you do you, nothing, you don't take nothing from the land, this all belongs to me. And for us, there's a, there's a picture of everything that we have, everything that we earn, God. We give back God the first fruits of our labor. So now Joshua... And this is, this is one of my favorite parts in this chapter. He keeps his promise to Rahab. Now, I, I imagine all that hype and all that excitement. If it was me, I would just completely forget about any promise I'd made to any woman. I'd just be steaming in there. But actually, Joshua doesn't. And he's really faithful like that. And it made me think about, you know, how sometimes... You know, I forgot my promises to people before and people have actually forgotten their promises or they've told me something and they've not followed it through. And it's just a reminder that, you know, we need to be more mindful of that. It's something that the Lord's put on my heart more recently, especially that, you know, when we say something to somebody, we need to follow that through. Not only is it a bad witness to people that don't know the Lord, but it kind of does something to you. It almost strips you of your self-worth. It's, it's a form of rejection. Uh, you just don't feel very important. But Joshua, he, he kept his promise. They got Rahab and the family, and they put her out of the camp, and they went on and to destroy the whole city. And finally, we reach the part where Joshua gives the command not to read uh, rebuild the city in verse 26 then Joshua charged them at, t at that time saying curse be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds this city Jericho he shall lay its foundation with his firstborn and with his youngest he shall set up its gates and this land he didn't want it rebuilding because this was a picture of how the sin of that that whole city how it displeased the Lord and this needed to be a sign to you and me here today that how he abhors that kind of thing. And, and he said to his people, you do not rebuild this city. But of course, <laughs> they're only human. And around 500 years later, you, you go into 1 Kings 16, verse 34, and it says, in his days, he held the Bethelite, built Jericho. He laid its foundations with the loss of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates with the loss of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. And it seems here that Ahab wanted to challenge Joshua's prophecy. And just like he said, he lost two of his sons through it. Um, we don't know how they die, but this is a clear warning to us that we cannot go against what God commands. He cannot go against what God tells us to do without paying the price. You cannot go and carry on in a way that he's clearly said, don't do that, because you will pay a consequence to that. So... The very end bit, so the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout the country. 
what a legacy to leave behind. I, I did think to myself, gosh, I'd really like to be like Joshua, um, just for people to sort of remember me and to be encouraged in their faith in that. And this has been written for us to encourage us that, you know, with God, we can be victorious in, in everything and we don't have to fear. He is with us. He never leaves us. That's his promise. So let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that it is a guidebook for the way you call us to live. And Lord, thank you that because of men like Joshua, being an example, we can have that victory in our own lives. Help us, Lord, to walk out our faith that we can be strengthened and encourage one another as we have this time in fellowship now. In Jesus' name. We worship the God who There's joy in the house of the Lord today.